I'm here with Richard Osborne on the Reaction Engine stand. Uh, Richard, could you tell us uh, what you do with the company and uh, what you've been working on? Um, my involvement is uh, working as a consultant through Airborne Engineering for Reaction Engines. Reaction Engines is basically uh, in charge of a project uh, called Project Stern and works with Airborne Engineering and the University of Bristol uh, to develop this very, very innovative uh, type of rocket engine. Uh, the, the rocket engine, uh, the Project Stern, is special because it uses a new type of nozzle called an ED nozzle. An ED stands for expansion deflection and basically where you have a conventional rocket nozzle uh, which you can see here and you can see at this part here um, normally you would have a hole straight up the middle with a rocket engine but with an ED nozzle you actually have a plug in the middle what that means is it forces hot exhaust gases from a combustion chamber round the edge of the actual exhaust nozzle. Okay? That means that in the centre you have a wake and that wake compensates according to the altitude. It's what's called an altitude compensating nozzle. The advantage of having an altitude compensating nozzle is it means that the vehicle is at optimum efficiency from sea level all the way up into space, whereas a conventional rocket nozzle only works well at a specific altitude. So this has a number of major benefits. Um, in use for the Skylong space plane, it would allow the runway or the, the actual takeoff on the runway to be 500 metres shorter and it would also add an extra half a tonne of payload uh, to the Skylon space plane. So it, it, from that perspective it has major uses and it, it offers a tremendous step forward compared with what we could otherwise achieve. Okay. Can you give us an overview of the Skylon um, spacecraft? And, uh, the, the, the Skylon space plane is a single stage to orbit space plane concept. It's in, at a stage where a number of the sub-components and technologies are currently under development. Um, it's something where we can tick off step by step uh, all the things that many people in the, in the industry would say are either not feasible or are very complicated. If we can reduce that down through a process of risk reduction, we can get to the point that it makes the whole concept even more viable than it already is. And many of us would argue that it is already supremely viable as it is. Now, this is where the Stern engine comes into it. Stern allows us to reduce the risk on one of the technologies, in this case, the ED nozzle. It allows us to test a rocket engine using hydrogen, because this is a hydrogen fueled rocket engine. It allows us to run air through at very high pressure to simulate the intake pressure that you get in the actual rocket engines on Skylon called the Sabre engines. It allows us to test the ignition system because it's quite difficult to ignite a hydrogen air breathing rocket engine we need to test that, that system works reliably and so far it, it does. We've been able to test the rocket engine with 12 hot firings and dozens and dozens of ignition tests using hydrogen and oxygen igniters. The nice bit about the ignition system is it uses igniters from the British RZ-20 program which was a hydrogen oxygen rocket engine developed in the late 1960s. So we have a bit of legacy hardware on this 21st century space plane, which is, from our point of view, is hugely exciting. Hmm. So you've done about 12 test firings so far. Could you give us an idea of what the future is? Do you have a, a number of more test firings to do? There's, there's a large number of test firings still to come. 12 tests is good, and it's given us an awful lot of information. And one of the reasons we're here this week 
um, in the form of reaction engines, airborne engineering and the University of Bristol is that we're able to present papers on the results of the tests. But more tests is always good and we already have the next phase of testing mapped out in terms of what we need to achieve uh, with, with the test programme. In terms of the number of tests, we don't yet know how many tests we need to do, but that's something that will come as we start the test programme. Okay. Um, could you give us an idea of, uh, of your background, how you came to be working on the project? Um, my background is originally as a physicist. Um, my degrees are in physics, then remote sensing specialising in planetary physics, and then I went on to do astrophysics. Um, specialising in stellar magnetohydrodynamics. Um, however, with this involvement, um, it was a case that reaction engines realised that airborne engineering, which is the company I'm currently working with, have done an awful lot on hybrid rocket engines and with hovering rocket platforms, um, but which are basically small rocket platforms that take off, hover, translate sideways and land, all using a gimbaled rocket engine. And the, the fact that we had developed these technologies very, very cheaply was something that was useful for reaction engines, which is how I got involved with the project. That, that, uh, your description there sounds like the requirements for the Lunar Lander Challenge. Have you considered entering for that We have. Um, we've actually had the hovering vehicle um, flying since 1995, so it predates a lot of the American um, hovering vehicles that are out there. However, because our vehicle is still fairly small, we decided that we didn't see at any point at this right now uh, to, to get the thing entered into the competition. But certainly in terms of controlling it, I think we'd be very confident that we could build a vehicle that, that could um, enter the challenge, um, not necessarily win, because the Americans have got some very, very good uh, teams, but we could certainly give them a run for their money. Okay, that's great. Okay, Richard Osborne, thank you very much. Thank you very much.